Hello and welcome to Writers' Book Club. This is the podcast where we take a deep dive with an author into the writing craft and process behind one of their books. I'm Michelle Barraclough and that whooshing sound you can hear in the back is torrential rain. Sydney is once again being deluged with rain and I hope wherever you are, you're staying safe and dry. This month, I had the very great pleasure of chatting with my friend, mentor, writing buddy and drinking champagne in the spa buddy and fabulous all-round author, Pamela Cook, about her most recent novel, All We Dream. Now, this novel had an interesting path to publication, not once, but twice. So I'll get Pam to explain all about that in the chat. My goodness me, we covered some ground. We talked about the differences between traditional and independent publishing, and Pam gave some fabulous tips on things like cover design and advertising and marketing. She also very generously ran through some of the before and after changes to the novel between its two editions and how those changes improved the novel. I was also really keen to talk to Pam about two writing craft aspects she's really knowledgeable about, and she actually teaches these to other writers how to write in deep point of view and how to, as she calls it, turn up the tension in your writing to keep your readers turning the page. Now, before we get to the interview, you may be able to also hear that I have a rotten cold. And while I'd like to think that I sound like Kathleen Turner from her Romancing the Stone days, I'm afraid it's more of a nasally red wine hangover style of tone. So I apologize in advance for that. Let me tell you a bit about Pamela Cook. Pam is the author of five novels, including the one we're discussing today, All We Dream. She writes women's fiction set in places you'll want to escape to and books that will keep you turning the page. Her novels feature tangled family relationships, the ups and downs of friendship, and they explore issues like grief and loss and belonging and love. Best-selling author Kelly Rimmer says, Pamela Cook is a rare, extraordinary talent. And I would wholeheartedly agree with that. The novel we're discussing today, All We Dream, is the story of a forgotten necklace, a family secret, and two women hiding from the truth. When successful Sydney lawyer Miranda McIntyre searches for something old to go with her wedding dress, she remembers an antique necklace from her childhood. Her mother's denial of its existence only deepens Miranda's curiosity but the discovery of a faded wedding photo and an old newspaper clipping reveal long-buried family secrets. Who is the woman in the photo and why are these keepsakes hidden in her mother's closet? Miranda's quest for the truth takes her on a road trip south to the idyllic seaside village of Pelican Point, where she stumbles upon a secluded clifftop cottage and the reclusive Esther Wilson. As Miranda begins to unravel the mystery, A tale of daring rescue, forbidden love, and shocking betrayal unfolds. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? And it is exciting. Let's dive into my interview with Pamela Cook. Hello, Pamela Cook. Hello, Michelle Barraclough. How are you? I'm good, thank you, lovely. I should probably say to the listeners that we both have pretty rotten colds at the moment, not COVID. Yeah, I've got this weird cough thing that just is nothing else except a bit of a cough. And Yeah. yeah. It's definitely going around. So we've both got our sexy husky voices on, but I'm so excited to talk to you about writing because that's what we do, Pam, isn't it? (laughs) We do, being in the same writing group and being writing buddies and podcasting buddies. Yeah, yeah. Pam and I spend quite a lot of time together talking about all things writing, all things podcasting, all things books and many other things besides. But today we are going to be talking about your last novel, All We Dream, which had a very interesting publishing journey, didn't it? It did. Now, you've done something many authors would absolutely love to do, and that is revisit a published novel and fix all the things you weren't happy with the first time around. I'd love to start with that unusual publishing journey of the novel from being traditionally published with Hachette through to last year's indie release. So go. Okay. Yeah, well, Firstly, I was browsing through it this morning, you know, in preparation for our our talk. And despite the fact that I did revise it to get rid of all the things I didn't like, of course, I found other things that I don't like. (laughs) Stop um, it. Stop reading it. But it it would not be revised again. (laughs) So, yeah, not only was it my last published novel independently, it was actually my second traditionally published novel under the title Essie's Way. 
so how that came about was I published my first novel, Black Wattle Lake, with Hachette in 2012 after being selected for their manuscript development program and very fortunately getting a publishing deal with them. So that came out in 2012 in December and I was just basking in the glow of of having your first novel published and that all happened fairly quickly because I got the notification from them or the phone call from them that they wanted to publish the book in, I think it was either May or June, and that book came out in December. So that happened. It was a very quick turnaround. So I hadn't really had any time to think about what was next or what, or to start writing anything else because I'd been deep in revisions for that book. It got to about February, so only a couple of months later, and my publisher said, oh, so what else have you got? And I just <laughs> the dreaded <sort> of <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, had the feeling of dread, exactly good word, and said, well, not a lot. And, in fact, I didn't have another novel. I only had a sort of literary style novel that I'd written after finishing a master's degree and then taking like six or seven years to write that. Black Bottle Lake was a completely different style of novel. It was rural fiction, commercial fiction. So, of course, they wanted something in the same vein. So I quickly scrambled onto the computer, found a few short things that I'd written. One was about a younger woman. One was a piece about an older woman. And they were like fragment type things, you know, that I'd just done these one-off pieces and thought, oh, maybe I can, you know, cobble something together here. And in the meantime, it was this weird process of, you know, when things just start to float around in your head. I had this idea of writing something about a shipwreck. And I think I'd recently been to Bendalong and seen the monument there about the shipwreck on the New South Wales south coast. And anyway, long story short is I started researching shipwrecks and I found a piece about a young girl who rescued somebody from the ocean from a shipwreck or a boat wreck on the coast of coast of Western Australia in the late, I think it was the late 1800s. Her name was Grace Bustleton. Anyway, straight away that rang bells because my first book had horses in it, it was rural, and I thought, oh, yeah, that would fit in really well. And then once I started to piece those things together and just started writing, it all just started to gel. But I had to write that really quickly because, of course, it was a book a year. They wanted the next book out in December. So oh, Pam. I started that probably late February. I did a couple of revisions on what I, on my draft. I had it to them around probably June. Then it went through a revision process with Hachette again, and then it was out in December. So whereas Blackwater Lake I'd written in 2009 as part of Nano, but I'd had a couple of years to do revisions on that before I'd submitted it. Yeah. So miraculously, it did actually come together as a story and the characters, you know, became their own people and all that sort of thing on the page. But I always felt that I kind of rushed it. I hadn't had enough time to develop the characters and the story in the way I wanted. And then also I re- I'd written three other books since that time and independently published Cross My Heart in 2019. And I felt my writing style had changed quite a bit. So when I got the rights back for Essie's Way, I just thought, why not? I'll just have another look. And, you know, I'm someone, as a lot of writers are, who once the book is is completely finished and it's off to the publisher, you never want to look at it again. Like, it's just no. (laughs) You know, when you have to do readings or something, it's like, oh, do I really have to read it again? So it was quite interesting to go back and read the whole thing again and, you know, when it had been my second published novel and just to see it in a different light. Also great having that time, you know, that was published in 2013. So I'd had like six years, six to seven years time for it to just sit there, you know, before I went and looked at it again. So also, why did you decide to rename it as well? Was it sufficiently different enough to warrant a new name? Well, look, not really in terms of the story. The story is really essentially the same. The characters are the same, the same things happen. There's a few additional scenes But essentially, the story itself is the same. I'm going to be really honest here. I always hated the title. Ah, okay. (laughs) I didn't choose the title. And I didn't feel that the title reflected anything, to be honest, about the story other than naming 
one of the characters, Essie, and that was really when that character was much younger than she actually appears in the main part of the story in the book. Mm. And when I sat down and thought, what are some of the themes, what are some of the motifs in it? And it had this dream element about it. You know, both the characters have these very strange dreams. Esther, Essie, when she's younger, has these quite prophetic dreams where it's like she sees what's going to happen before it happens. And Miranda, the younger character, there's a few sort of dream sequences in there for her as well. And so then I started actually thinking, oh, it'd be good to have an epigraph or something around this idea of dreams. So I started doing a little bit of research and I found a poem by Edgar Allan Poe and it had this line in it. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. And that was the title of the poem, A Dream Within a Dream. So then I thought, oh, I could pull something out from that about to do with the title. And yeah, it just seemed to work. And it was three words. My previous books, a lot of them have had like three words or syllables. So it it seemed to fit. Was it also really good to have another stab at the cover as well for yourself? Yes, yes. So uh, as a rural fiction author, obviously, with Hachette, my covers all had something to do with a country theme, you know, like the girl on the cover of Blackwater Lake with the hat. Essie's Way, the original cover, had just a little cabin in the background, which was quite similar to how I envisaged Esther's shack that she lives in and just a girl standing on the cover. But I wanted to, because I've sort of gone really more into a women's fiction style of writing, I wanted to to change that up. And I also, there's quite a strong historical thread in the novel. So I also wanted to have that reflected in the cover as well. And I wanted to have whoever was on the cover, the woman, that it could be Esther or it could be Miranda. So I was really, really excited. And you'll remember, Michelle, it yeah. as being part of my Inkwell group, you know, that I got the covers, cover, you know, briefs from the designer. And there were a few different options that we could have gone with. And there was a lot of toing and froing and, and heartache. It's so hard because you think it's going to be so exciting to choose your own cover, and it is because, you know, for anybody out there who isn't aware, if you're traditionally published, the publisher, well, I was going to say 90% of the time, but I'll change that to 100% of the time, the publisher chooses the cover in consultation with the author. But to be able to choose your own cover to reflect the story that you've written and what you feel is in the book is really exciting. But it's also very daunting because... You know, it's up to you as the author to get that right. And if you don't, you know, the covers are so important. So it's quite a daunting process and it was really good to be able to share it around, you know, with my writing buddies yeah. and, uh, yeah, get the op- opinions and we narrowed it down. <laughs> yeah, it's a case of be careful what you wish for. You might want to have a big say over your cover, but it's also a lot of pressure. I loved the image that you eventually chose because it wraps around the whole book. If anyone hasn't seen the cover... It's a beautiful, atmospheric shot of a woman on a beach from any time period, really. But the other thing I love about this is that it matches thematically with your other indie published book, Cross My Heart. And the Mm. two of them, actually, when I pulled my copy of All We Dream out, it looked so lovely next to Cross My Heart on my bookshelf. They're a matching pair and they look like they're meant to be together. And so I love the way you did that as well. You've got a lovely eye for design, Pam. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I have got a fantastic cover designer. I can't say who it is because she actually works for a a publishing house and does work on the side. But yeah, I was ecstatic. And and as I said, the girl on the front, when the book opens, Miranda is standing in a wedding dress. So the girl on the cover could easily be Miranda or it could have been Esther when she was younger. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely got that timeless quality about it, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, I was really happy with it. What are some of the other advantages that you found with indie publishing compared to traditionally publishing, Pam? Mm. Well, of course, you have control over everything. You're not just the author. You're the, you know, that you're to some extent the editor, although, you know, I made sure that I had really professional edits done. My big thing when I decided to indie publish was that I wanted the books to read like and look like every other book on the shelf that people wouldn't pick it up and go, oh, it's a a self-published book. And that's not to be, you know, critical of self-published books, but, you know, I think there are some some cover designs are better than others Mm -hmm. and I just wanted it to have that feel of a traditionally published book or a very professional look anyway. 
So, yeah, you are, you're everything. You know, you're also the, the marketer, the promotions person. So that's great on the one hand because it does give you control over things like when you release it, how long before, you know, it goes up onto the platforms are you going to start advertising and publicising it? Who do you want to send copies to if you want to send out ARCs? You know, you've got control over all of that. I have to say, if I hadn't been through the traditional publishing process myself, I think I would have found it a lot harder because I had built up a network of writer friends who I could either call on for advice, you know, if they had been indie published themselves or also to send ARCs to, to get cover quotes from that sort of thing. So all that stuff I found a lot easier and I know a lot of people just do it from scratch without, you know, having that experience and I really take my hat off to them. I also found I did the Mark Dawson self-publishing course, which I found really, really useful. And, of course, you get lifetime access to that so you, and it's always being updated so you can dip in and out of that. But, yeah, it's the other thing is that you have the ability to do, you know, Facebook and Amazon advertising which is really important. And I, like to be completely honest, I still haven't got my head around the ins and outs of all that. I did a lot of that with Cross My Heart because it was my first indie release. I did a little bit with All We Dream, not as much. But it's a yeah, massive it's, field. It's like a whole other, huge. you know, industry, isn't it? Social media advertising. Oh, it, it really is. Yeah, all the social media as well. And of course, you can hire people along the way to help you. So with my first independent release, Cross My Heart, I did hire a consultant to handle a lot of the process, like the uploading to, you know, the platforms, the form he had someone formatted. I had already had it edited. With All We Dream, I didn't do a structural edit because it had already had a structural yeah. edit and I wasn't really changing the story. I knew there were scenes I wanted to insert and where to insert them. I knew there were things I wanted to expand on or delete so it didn't really need a structural edit, but I did have a professional copy edit. But, yeah, with All We Dream, I organised all of that myself, including the formatting, which was mm -hmm. interesting and exciting, you know, using Vellum as a program, which was brilliant. But, yeah, it is great on the one hand to have all that control, but it's also an enormous workload and you really have to be organised in terms of your timeline, you know, work out when your release date is and then pretty much work backwards from there in terms of, of when everything has to be done, setting your own deadlines for things. Did you find that you could add a bit more of a personal touch as well? Like with sending out ARCs, I know the publishers are, are great at sending out advanced reader copies. That's for those who don't know what an ARC is, to all and sundry to podcast hosts and to book bloggers and to all sorts of people in the industry. But they sort of just arrive and sometimes there's a follow-up sometimes there isn't were you able to add that bit more of a personal touch would you say that's another advantage yeah for sure so you know as I said I had built up quite a network after having four books traditionally published and then then the, the next one was indie I'd also done some facilitating at festivals had the podcast going so I would generally just email or message someone and say hey I've, I'm doing this book would you like a copy would you like an arc and, you know, everybody's lovely. And that's the great thing about the Australian writing community and, you know, the writing network is that everybody is so supportive and fantastic. And so many people had it on their social media. You know, I don't expect everybody that I send the book to necessarily to read it or that it's going to be their cup of tea. But, you know, just sharing the images and telling people about the book and it reach, it's reaching their network as well then. So, you know, I think with Trad Publishing, they always ask you, oh, do you have people that you'd like us to send a copy of the book to? And you can do that. But, yeah, you can do lovely little personalised things, you know, if you want to wrap the book up in, in lovely paper or put a little note in it and things like that. I think those touches always are really nice as well. Yeah, I agree. And it's like you've taken every great idea in publishing and put it into this book, Pam. I mean, not only is it just beautiful quality, the cover, the paper, the layout's gorgeous with all the little flourishes, etc. But you've added at the back, and this is, I think, so clever, you've added a first chapter, a sneak peek from Cross My Heart, so that's terrific. You've also devoted a page to all of your other books with a blurb and a testimonial and how they can get a hold of that. You've also got an invitation here to join your mailing list. So that's really smart marketing. You've also got a page in a beautiful conversational tone. Could you please take the time to write a review and how people can do that? 
you know, it's just like you've taken every great idea in publishing and wrapped it up in this book. I think it's just, you just did such a great job. And anyone who is interested in publishing independently would do very well to take a lesson from All We Dream. Oh, thank you. Well, I did, you know, you do pick up a lot of things along the way. So whether you're indie published or traditionally published or hybrid, which is a combination of the two and probably what I consider myself to be now, is learning, you know, learning about things along the way, learning craft, obviously, but also learning things about the business and how to do things. And as I mentioned, the Mark Dawson course was great for that. And just being involved in different Facebook groups and taking on things that you like that other people have done in their books. So... Yeah, it was just a conglomeration, I guess, of all those things. So in terms of the writing or the rewriting, what would you say were the major changes between the two versions? And perhaps more importantly, why did those changes do you feel need to be made? You mentioned something about character development. I guess apart from the the dream thing that I, I talked about expanding on, and that really, for me, pulled the whole thing together. Like it once I realised, oh, wow, it's got this dream theme, I really then highlighted that in different ways. So, for instance, I inserted the whole of the Edgar Allan Poe poem, and I could do that because it's out of copyright. It's more than 100 years old. I used part of that as the epigraph. But then I really, in those dream sequences, I really sort of highlighted this sense of, you know, unreality and also that idea of us looking at ourselves like through a mirror in, in the dream. Even in the opening, I put a little allusion to to that idea. So there was that. And I think apart from that, it was really about deepening the point of view because I'd started to write more deliberately in deep point of view. So I started that really deliberately and crossed my heart and I wanted to go back and see if I could apply that then to... Essie's way. And interestingly, there was more of that in there than I had thought there would be when I went back to read it. I thought, yes, there, I, there was already doing a lot of that. So it was more about refining that and also probably digging deeper into the psychology of the characters and the emotions of the characters. So for instance, the main character, Miranda, the story is really about her search for her grandmother. And the motivation for that is because of her dysfunctional relationship, if you like, with her mother. Her mother is very aloof. She obviously has some sort of mental health issue that's never been addressed or named. And it has impacted greatly on Miranda's own, you know, sense of self and Mm. and sense of belonging. So her search to find her grandmother is really part of that whole part of her finding herself, you know, And I really wanted to, that was there. I felt it was there in Essie's way, but it wasn't really highlighted enough and I wanted to draw that out more. Pam, is there an example in All We Dream that you could read to us that shows some of the changes that you made? Mm. So I can read you the opening paragraph in each if you like, um, if it's not too long. And, you know, there is a bit in the middle that's pretty much the same, but hopefully you'll see just a couple of the subtle changes that I made that, both deepen the point of view and start to tap into this idea of Miranda really looking deeply inside herself and feeling conflicted, I guess. So setting up that inner conflict more strongly. That would be terrific. It's not often that we learner writers get a chance to see a before and after. That's why (laughs) I wanted to have you on the podcast. I think this is so Uh, interesting and so useful to other writers. The other thing, actually, which we might be able to do too, Michelle, is I had a prologue in the original and that's gone in this one. So maybe we can talk about that as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So this is Essie's Way, the original. Sydney, chapter one. Miranda stared at the woman in the wedding gown. She watched as she ran her fingers over the scalloped edge of the neckline, tracing the pattern on the lace. Small sprays of roses joined by delicate vines that curled around one bunch and looped to the next. The silk lining swished deliciously beneath the ivory satin waistband as the woman turned one way and then the other in front of the full-length mirror. She reached up and unpinned her hair from its bun, letting it fall loosely across her shoulders. A faint smile skimmed her lips and then vanished. Her gaze flickered briefly to the floor as if she was uncertain of something, but then, squaring her shoulders, she lifted her chin and peered straight into the eyes of her reflection. So that's the original. That's the original. And... As I said, the changes are only subtle, but I think when you make 
subtle sorts of changes overall, then, you know, it, the whole is, is greater than the sum of the parts type yeah. thing. So this is the revised opening. A strange tingling rippled beneath her skin as she watched the woman in the wedding dress. Her vision blurred. She squeezed her eyes shut, then opened them again, focusing all her attention on the movements of the soon-to-be bride. The way her fingers traced the scalloped edge of the neckline, following the pattern on the lace. Small sprays of roses joined by delicate vines curling around one bunch and looping to the next. The silk lining swished deliciously beneath the ivory satin waistband as the woman turned one way and then the other in front of the full-length mirror. She reached up and unpinned her hair from its bun, letting it fall loosely across her shoulders. A faint smile skimmed her lips, then vanished. Her gaze flickered briefly to the floor, but then, squaring her shoulders, she lifted her chin and stared straight back. I've noticed straight away we have more visceral reactions there. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. At the beginning. So instead of going straight into description, we're, we're straight into yeah. her body, aren't we? Exactly. Yeah. And then I took out, she stared at her reflection at yes. the end because that's telling the reader she's looking at her reflection instead of she lifted her chin and stared straight back. So we're staying in Miranda's physical space i love that pam that's such a great example yeah they are subtle changes and as you say it's adding in that that visceral feeling and you know i do i i can have a tendency to overdo that and i know you michelle were very good in cross my heart when i i actually added a lot of visceral stuff in you went through for me and said strike that one strike that one you know i, I tended to overdo it but i do think that using some of those reactions does really put the reader in the character's skin and it really gelled for me a few years ago when I was reading Donald Mass and in his emotional craft of fiction. Oh, He's yeah. a wonderful he's teacher, just, isn't he? He is. It's, I just highly recommend his craft books to everybody. I think I've got all of them. But this is in The Emotional Craft of Fiction and he says here, readers fundamentally want to feel something not about your story but about themselves. They want to feel like they've been through something. They want to connect with your characters and live their fictional experience or believe they have. We feel things in our body, you know, and in our senses. So for me, that's what I, I was trying to inject, I guess, into the original version. It must have been fun in a way to apply that principle to your words, your own words, and think, how can I bring a little bit more show and instead of tell into this or get people more into the body of this character rather than just telling them how they're feeling? Yeah, yeah. And, I, like, I know that we do need to tell in places, and I think with deep point of view, you know, you're always going to have, to some extent, a little bit of that narrative voice coming in because otherwise the reader's going to think, oh, where the hell are we, what's happening? You know, you need someone or some voice directing the action but for me, as much as possible, I like to then stay in that character's skin as much as I can. Yeah, because in the first version, I guess we went straight into, and you're very good at description, but we did go straight into the description of the dress and how the dress felt and looked to Miranda. But in the new version, we get straight into how she's feeling about things. And we know just from the fact that her vision has blurred she squeezes mm -hmm. her eyes shut and opens them again. We get that feeling something's not quite right for her. And we don't know that from the first version, do we, from that description, because it's just a woman looking at her. And it's a beautiful description of her wedding dress and how it feels and how it looks. But mm -hmm. now, immediately from the very first line, we know something's not quite right for her. Yes, I wanted to bring that more to the forefront of the, the opening paragraph, you know, that whole idea of hooking your reader in and... and and I think a lot of the time it is that thing that we don't know exactly what's wrong, but we get a sense of this inner conflict for the character. And even that line, that sentence, her vision blurred, you know, I thought that quite very vaguely taps into this whole dream thing. So it's like she's also also got this sense of unreality about. And I know that, you know, often you do have those those moments, particularly like when you're getting married and you see yourself in a wedding dress and things like that, that, oh, wow, is that me? But I wanted it to be a bit more than that and, you know, but to show her sort of experiencing that but then pushing through, you know, which was scaring the shoulders and looking straight back. So, yeah, little changes that hopefully, you know, make a difference. Pam, I love the structure of this novel. 
the vignettes that take us in and out of the pivotal moments in each character's life at that point in time, I think they show us so much about their character and who they are. And as you know, I'm a big fan of the vignette. So we alternate between Miranda and Esther in the present day. So Miranda as a young woman, Esther as an older woman. And then we get these wonderful flashbacks into Esther's life as a young woman via her diaries, which we're reading along with Miranda as she's discovering more and more about who this woman Esther is and what she means to her own life. Can you tell us about how this structure evolved on the page for you as you were writing? Was it sort of planned this way or did it just roll onto the page? Did you write them separately and then blend? How did that all work? Yeah, well, initially, going back to my original response to, you know, when the original book was written, it all happened in such a hurry. And I just, I knew, okay, I've got these two characters, one's young, one's old. The original version of Miranda, she'd walked in on her fiancé when he was in bed with her best friend or something. That all completely went because I wanted, yeah, (laughs) I wanted her to make the decision that she makes later on of her own volition, like it was her choice, not forced into it. And I wanted to really highlight this search that she has for her her past in a sense, but obviously her grandmother and her grandmother's past. So I knew from the beginning it was going to be two characters, <clears throat> excuse me, and one young, one old. So that was great in that there were straightaway different voices and it was very easy for me to tap into Esther's voice. I had a, a number of great aunts when I was a kid growing up. We used to go and visit and I drew on the way that they spoke. They were country women and her voice just came to me really, really easily. And then I thought Esther is a very closed character. So Miranda is is out there. She's actively looking for a grandmother. She takes herself up on this quest down the south coast to try and find her grandmother. So, you know, she's she's young. She's a lot more open in terms of her personality. But Esther is a, an isolated, secluded, closed character. So she was never going to reveal a lot about herself, you know, to Miranda or to the reader. And I thought, well, how is Miranda going to find out about her past? Because she's not going to tell her. She's, you know, very secretive. And then I came up with this idea of diaries. And, again, it was that as soon as I started writing the diaries from Essie, who is the younger Esther, it just it felt really natural and really easy. And I have wondered since, why aren't I writing historical fiction? Because <laughs> that, <gasps> that voice actually came to me quite quite easily, you know. I could tell from the writing because, like, you go straight into those diaries and you're just hooked from the first page. Oh, good. I'm glad. But it did, it sort of takes you back in time then, so it adds that other historical layer to the novel. And Miranda still has a lot of things she has to piece together, but she starts to get an idea of who this woman, Esther, was when she was younger. And then, of course, there's still a lot of mystery around that because the diaries end at a certain point too and she can't you know, find out any more until later on when Esther is quite fragile and she does reveal more about what happened in her life. But, yeah, structurally it's sort of like the story within a story. And for the older Esther, she's now so disconnected from who she was when she was younger. It's like that was another person, you know, and it's like another life or almost a dream for her. So it all kind of fitted together. So when you sat down to write, did that just all sort of come to you or was that sort of like, no, I've really got to focus on getting some information across to the reader in this scene as well? When I sort of had the initial idea for the two characters and then got the idea about this woman rescuing someone from the sea and and Mm -hmm. the whole coastal farm thing, I, I did have to, because I was writing under contract, I had to give a synopsis across to my publisher. It was really rough and, but it, it actually you know, as synopses do, even though we hate them, it forced me to come up with some kind of storyline. So I had a little bit of a framework. It changed as I wrote. It'd be interesting to go back and pull out that original synopsis now and see how different it was. But I did have a little bit of a framework. But the other thing that I wanted to make sure I was doing is that I started with Miranda's story, so the contemporary story, and then I would sit down and say, okay, so what is Esther doing while Miranda's doing that? What's basically what's happening for Esther at the same time? So the reader was seeing like these snapshots of what was happening for Esther because initially you don't know who Esther really is. So it's just this old woman living in a shack by the beach. So 
until they actually meet and are in the same place at the same time, I tried to have it so that, you know, those scenes were happening simultaneously but in different places. And then for the rest of the story, essentially, for a lot of it, they are together or in the same vicinity. And then, of course, you go into the diaries. So I think from memory when I wrote the diaries, I think I wrote the diaries all in one and then broke them up because, of course, she reads a certain amount of the diary, then has to go off and do something and then reads another amount. So that was the only thing that I wrote and broke up. The rest of it was written alternately, you know, alternating the characters. Gosh, how did you keep that time frame in your mind as well, Pam? Yeah, look, the whole time frame thing kind of does my head in. It still does after six books, really. I'm not very good at keeping track of timelines and I always it's always something in revision that I have to go back and, and really work on and I end up having scrapbooks with these big things drawn out on them and separate timelines for each character and things like that. So every book I vow that I'm going to keep track of the timeline better. Um, I'm writing another book at the moment and I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think you just get into the, oh, right, the next scene and the next scene and then and suddenly you realise, oh, hang on, when is all this happening, you know, and how, how long a time period is this happening over? And the other thing that does do my head in a bit is that whole, you know, well, how much would she read in two hours? Mm. Well, you're, you're sort of condensing time really because yeah. even though Miranda is in the lounge room secretly reading the diaries while Esther's asleep, and that might happen over a period of two hours, but you're not really giving the reader two hours worth of diary. You know mm. what I mean? You know, it is that suspension of belief in, in a way that we, we go into when we start reading a fictional book. Yeah. You want to mirror it as much as you can, but it's it would be impossible to have it completely realistic. Otherwise, you know, our books would be... yes hundreds and hundreds of thousands of words long. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it, it does make sense that you wrote all of the diaries in one hit because you don't want that, is it the left brain, that analytical brain going, oh, no, I better stop here because you really just want your creativity to flow, don't you? You just want the words to flow and just to be able to get yeah. it out there because timeline stuff, that's all using a very different part of your brain. And so you, you can apply that as much of a headache as it is, Pam, but you can apply all that in the edits, can't you? That can all be fixed later. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And there's great apps now. There's an app uh, program called Plotter, P-L-O-T-T-R, which I have actually started using, which does help a little bit. But the other thing that I'm trying to do, and I went back and did this for the chapters that I've written of my current work in progress, is at the top of each chapter, and I mean, it will be deleted, no doubt, later, but writing the day, at the top of each chapter so that I know when it happens, whether it's the day, day one, and then it might be Thursday, day five, you know, just so that in my head I know how much time has elapsed since the last scene. Of course, if you're not going to use those labels, then you have to think to yourself, okay, how am I going to indicate to the reader that this amount of time has passed or, you know, it's probably going to be an internal thought that the character has or whatever. But at least then for you, while you're drafting and revising, you can hopefully keep it straight. Anyway, that's what I'm trialling. <laughs> I think that sounds really smart because it's not going to take you out of the creative flow too much just by putting down a date and a time and then just mm. getting stuck into the writing. But it hopefully will cut down on the work later on when you're trying to unravel yeah. the timeline. Yeah. And so I mentioned about the prologue in the the early one and I realised when I when I went back and had a look at the prologue, I think we were doing it initially to set up that the book had a historical thread to it. And I think we, just from from thinking back, talking to my publisher, Vanessa Radnich at Hachette, we wanted the reader to have some sense that there was going to be a historical timeline. And the prologue is actually written in third person and it's taken from a scene when Essie, so the young Essie, actually looks out the window and sees a boat in trouble out on the ocean because she's living in a farmhouse which is is on the coast and then decides to go out and get the farm hand Samuel who is an indigenous character in the story and is her lover at the time even though her secret lover and she gets him and they go out and rescue the guy so that was that was putting into it that snippet that I'd found about Grace Bustleton re- rescuing this guy when I took that out I actually put it into the diaries and made it 
a first person scene from Esther's point of view, which I think really strengthened the the sense because it was a pretty, it was a very sensory scene. You know, there was wind howling, and of course they were in the ocean, and the horse was there, and all that sort of thing. So I just had a read of the two of them again this morning, and I thought, yeah, it definitely strengthened it, putting it back into the diary and making it third person. I wonder what drove that decision initially to put that up front. And do you think that goes to the way writing and reading has changed a little bit in the intervening years where now we're quite used to reading contemporary slash historical novels like, for Mm. example, Natasha Lester's novels? and Leanne Moriarty's novels where they have these dual timelines and we're used to it. We don't need the prologue necessarily these days, do we? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think we are used to that and also books that cross genre, you know, to some extent like Where the Crawdads Sing, you know, it's got mystery, it's got romance, it's got beautiful setting, it's got the contemporary story. So, yeah, I I think that's definitely part of it. And also we were setting up this idea of, the dream because it's an experience that Essie had dreamed would happen and then it did happen and we were setting that up in the prologue but then I just decided when I did the revision that I wanted that to be revealed gradually not up front so yeah I mean you know yeah. if, I think it worked okay with the prologue but then when I did the revision I just thought no I want that to be revealed more gradually more slowly and drip feed that idea of the dream through rather than have that up front. Yeah, because it's not necessarily the inciting incident. So why would it be right at the front, you know? You've got to set yeah. that, set the world up first, don't you? Yeah, yeah, that's what I decided. It's perfect where it is now. It's in that part of that story of, you know, that, that what's it called? The turning point, isn't it, for, mm, mm. for, for young Essie? Yes, and that's interesting, I guess, too, structurally, in that each of the characters, so if you count young Essie as a separate character to Esther, because in a sense she really she is, really is yeah. I wanted each of those stories to have their own structure. So, you know, Miranda's story has the inciting incident where she she is getting married, she wants to have a necklace for her wedding dress, and it triggers a memory for her of a necklace that she found in her mother's jewellery box when she was younger. And then, of course, when she questions her mother about it, her mother has this completely over-the-top reaction, which is not unusual for her because she does fly off the handle a lot. But then it really embeds for Miranda in her mind, yes, there's something, some mystery around that necklace. There's something strange that I remember, but she couldn't quite put a finger on it. So that encourages her then to go in search of the necklace, and that's what triggers her search for her grandmother. So she has her own, obviously, character arc, Essie, in a sense, had her own character arc, but then that is also tied to Esther's character arc because, you know, we're meeting Esther as an old and we don't know any of her background initially until Miranda starts delving into the diaries. And then so I wanted to use that backstory really as part of the reveal about what had happened to Esther and why she's like she is, Yeah, you know, why she's this crusty old (laughs) isolated woman living on her own and not wanting anything to do with the world type thing. Yeah, yeah. You talked before about that blend of genres, and I think you've really done such a great job of blending contemporary, historical, there's a mystery element, there's a romance element or a love story. Uh, Two of them, actually, Mm. Essie's and, and Miranda's. And they all have their challenges as well. And that's even older Esther, you know, she's not just this woman that's had these challenges in her past. She has current obstacles in her path, her health, people are trying to get her out of her house. So is that the sort of writing you like to do and the style of reading you like to do as well, where you have a mix of those elements? Yes, definitely. So I mentioned Crawdads and that's probably one of my favourite most recent books because you know, apart from the beautiful writing of Delia Owens, I love having all those different elements. I think it just adds so many layers to the plot. And, you know, like I know that for traditional publishers, they like to put us in boxes, you know. So I was basically marketed as a rural romance author, even though there was romance in in all of the books that are traditionally published, but it was a romantic element rather than the romance being the main part of the story. But I know... And, and, you know, if you're a crime writer, you're marketed as a crime writer. If you're historical fiction, that, that's your box type thing. 
And I guess that's one asset that independent authors have is that you don't have to put yourself in a box. Yes, you can you can target your advertising to historical romance readers, but you can also target it to, you know, mystery readers or historical or contemporary fiction readers. So you do have the ability to, I think, connect with more readers across different genres if you can target your ads properly and if you know how to do that. That's the tricky mm-hmm. part. But for me, yeah, I love to have that blend. But my main goal is always, or the main thing I'm focusing on is the woman, the main protagonist's character arc. You know, who is she at the beginning? How does she change over the course of the story and become more of herself, more true to herself at the end? And sometimes meeting a, a romantic partner or, or having a romance along the way is a part of that transformation. And for Miranda, you know, she does meet someone else, even though she is, sorry, spoiler. We love <laughs> to do spoilers, Michelle. Yeah, we're all about the spoilers. Yeah, yeah. So she is getting married at the beginning of the story and she has no intention of meeting anyone else. You know, she goes off on this quest to find her grandmother. Just so happens that along the way she meets someone else and, and that is integral to, I guess, her final decision in what she does at the end of the book. So I think being able to bring all those different elements into the story allows you as the writer to develop different aspects of the character as well. You see them in different situations with different people, how they're going to respond, how the outcome of those scenes then, you know, pushes them into the next part of their development. So I really like working with all those sorts of ideas as I'm writing. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the crawdads. Oh, so looking forward to going to that movie, Pam. I think that oh, might yes. need to be a, Me too. <laughs> a gold class outing for us. But Definitely. you're right, it has it has the mystery element. There's a kind of a, that lovely grand friendship slash love story. But that female character's arc, it sweeps you away. And a lot of the stories that you and I both love have that, don't they? Yeah, Definitely. Did you just read The Paper Palace as well? I yes. did, yes, yeah, and I loved it. That. I loved it. And, yeah. yeah, I love that for the same reasons, in a, in a way, the setting, the way, you know, the character's obviously in a very difficult situation that's mm. set up right at the beginning of the book. But I also love the way that Miranda Cowley Heller, Heller Cowley, yes. yeah. in, the, in The Paper Palace takes us back in time, which is a little bit like what I did here, I guess, with Essie and Esther, is going back in time to seeing who the characters were originally. And then that allows the reader to understand why they're like they are now, you know, and making the decisions that they're making now too. It also allows you to be invested in the outcome of their journey because if you were to just say, oh, there's this woman and she broke off her engagement and she finds who her grandmother is, that's all very well and good. But we'd love to know more about why she's made those decisions and and with Essie as well. She's not just a cranky old woman. That's not very interesting in itself. But when we know what's happened to her in her life, in her youth, and there's conflicts and the obstacles and she, the heartbreak and everything that she's faced, we're very much invested in her as a character. Yes, definitely. And I'm always interested in who people are on the outside, mm. who they appear to be, but then there's a lot more going on that's mm. that's created who we are, you know, and sometimes people are completely different on the inside, you know, that they have a, a face that they show to the world, but underneath there's someone else so that can be really interesting too speaking about character pam one of the signatures of your writing is your ability to write in deep point of view which you alluded to earlier and you've done that so well in this novel can you tell us a bit more about this concept of deep point of view and perhaps give us an example of how you used it in all we dream Yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think deep point of view is really all about getting inside the skin of your character as much as you can and sort of removing that narrative distance between the reader and the narrator to to some extent. So, you know, you can can use it in either first or third person. It's really about this whole idea of tuning into the character's emotional state. And I guess that's where, you know, I talked about Donald Mass earlier I also a few years ago did a fabulous course with an author called Lisa Hall Wilson who has, she's got a Facebook group called Going Deeper with Emotions and she has a great website. 
where she has some really good blogs on all this. And she also has a good book called Method Acting for Writers. And really, if you think about that idea of method acting, if you see a live performance or even a great film and you see the actor on the stage and that acting is done so well that you forget that that's an actor, that's the goal, obviously, for the actor is to become that character so fully that the viewer is believing that he or she is that person. And so really that's what Deep Point of View is, trying to do that on the page, you know, inhabit the character so fully that the reader forgets really that there's a narrator there. That's the goal. I think it is very hard to be 100% Deep Point of View because, as I said before, you need that movement from scene to scene or sometimes you need I was talking to Cassie Hamer about this recently in in the podcast episode I'm putting out on Friday with Cassie about her book The Truth About Faking It and she starts each chapter with this sort of wide angle lens telling the reader what's happening in a sentence or two but then we're in the character's skin so it's like the character zooming out and then really zooming in and almost going inside the character. Give us an example Pam. They're just like subtle differences, I think. So there's a scene where Miranda goes to the beach. She's, so she's directed, you know, by a person in this local town that she goes looking for her grandmother, Pelican Point. She's told there's Esther Wilson lives in this shack on the headland and she walks along the beach. So this is just a paragraph. So the original was the sound of a barking dog startled her to attention. He was running along the sand towards her. Something about the way he was bounding like a circus clown told her he was friendly. She'd always liked dogs, had a natural affinity with them, despite never having had one. Her mother had disliked their smell and the way they dropped hair all over the carpet, although Miranda had always wondered how her mother had known this, never actually having owned a dog herself. So that paragraph in the revision, again, quite subtle, a dog barked instead of the sound of a barking dog, startled her to attention. So it's just you're there, you hear the dog, it barks. Okay, so, So you're really cutting out anything that's extraneous, and you're cutting out as much of the telling as you can. So a dog barked. She stood peering over her glasses to where he was running along the sand towards her. So, you know, she she looks over her glasses. We see what she's seeing, the dog coming towards her. Right. Something about the way he was bounding like a circus clown told her he was friendly. Now, I would not write that sentence the same way now. You wouldn't? I, I would, no, because it's not completely deep point of view. So where I've said told her he was friendly that is really an outside narrator telling there Mm. so it would become probably something more like bounding around like a circus clown and i'd probably just leave it at that the reader can surmise that he's friendly from that description so a lot of this stuff is about really cutting out anything that's extraneous and cutting out the telling and just putting the image there so you know you are sort of going slightly in and out of this narrative telling in a way but you're trying to minimize that as much as you can so yeah like I said at the beginning they're not huge changes um but it is just that change in Mm. focus I guess and I always like to think about you know where is the narrator at each point are they right inside the character's head are they inside their body um you know and you can move that little person (laughs) around depending on the effect you want to create so there might be moments in the story where you do want to have that distance. If it's a memory or the character is feeling disconnected from themselves, you know, you might want to have more narrative distance. But if you do want to really try and up that connection between the reader and the, the character, then you want to try and be in their skin and have that little narrator inside their body as much as possible. And so how does a deep point of view work in terms of dialogue? Is that allow you to cut out a lot of dialogue tags and telling in that way as well? Yes. So I made a mission. Uh, It's probably not so much in, although I think I did do it fairly consistently in All We Dream in the revision, but I know in Cross My Heart um, I didn't use any dialogue tags. Wow. So there's no said Pam, said Miranda, whatever. It's just the, the dialogue and then the action. So there is a bit here actually where we, when we first meet Esther, uh, she's in the cave, so she's, she's full and she's been fishing and Miranda finds her in the cave. So the dog barks and she follows the dog. So he raced back out from the shadows, stared up at her and whined. Okay, boy, what have you got to show me? Miranda followed the dog a few steps into the cave. Then we see the inside of the cave from her perspective and then she bangs her head and says, oh, shit, 
and then there's just there's no need for that sort of language. The voice was low and slightly hoarse, but it was definitely coming from the figure on the ground. So if that wasn't so much in deep point of view, it would probably be there's no need for that sort of language, said a husky voice from the back mm, of the cave. Mm. Miranda, she doesn't know who yes. it is. So you wouldn't use Esther there as part of the dialogue tag. Yeah, We've got to find things out as she finds them out. Yeah. I like how you, you also use action with dialogue. That really works. It creates a visual, you know, because when we're in a conversation with another person, we're not having that statically just sitting we're always doing something. So, and I think if you give the reader an action dialogue, um, it does take out the narrative distance because you haven't got the narrator saying, you know, said Harry, you're giving the dialogue and then what that person is doing, it's giving a visual, It's it can be telling something about the character, it can be creating a pause, you know, so if there was a pause in the conversation or there was a moment of silence, I would put an action in there that stands for that pause, if that makes sense. So, for example, here when she's having a drink with James, he studied the neck of his beer bottle and shrugged. It's just sort of <laughs> looking at the neck of his beer bottle and not looking at her and shrugging, that tells us that he's a bit dismissive of her mother. Yeah, it does. I think it's a matter of um, trusting that the reader's going to pick up those cues that you're giving to so you're painting that picture for the reader and you want the reader to be actively engaged in the text in the narrative so if you tell them everything you're taking away that sense of engagement that they can have with the text and i think it also dilutes the tension a lot because there's nothing really for the reader to guess or to think about or to wonder about if you're just telling them everything. So at the other end of the spectrum, there are some parts where you do have to tell the reader things, and that is in terms of setting, right? So I think another one of your signatures is your ability to write setting. I always feel like I'm really there. How important was the setting in this novel and do you have a specific process or any rules you stick to when you're writing or editing descriptions of your settings? Look, any novel with a beautiful setting that I can immerse myself in is something that I'm, I'm always attracted to, hence things like Crawdads, Lost Flowers of Alice Hart, Paper Palace, all those books that really draw us into the setting. So it's something that I really want to do with my own writing. And even though I feel that rural romance was necessarily my um, genre to an extent that that I have spent a lot of time in the country. I now live on a property. I didn't when I was writing my, my earlier books, but I now live on a property with horses. I've spent a lot of time outdoors, got a great affinity with the South Coast. Um, I've also written one book which was set in outback Queensland. One thing I always try to do is to go to the place where in my mind the book is set um, because I just love to experience what it's like to be in that place um, because part of both deep point of view and I think creating evocative setting is to actually filter the the setting through the character's consciousness so you know if you and I walked into a room or into a space we would probably notice different things about it initially based on who we are and the experiences we've had in our lives previously we might have a different vibe about the place a different emotion so it speaks to characterization as well. I think if you can really filter the, the setting through the character's headspace, through their, their visceral space and show what they're experiencing when they're in the setting. So you're not just gratuitously going, oh, the reader needs to know what this place looks like. Bang, here's a paragraph showing that. It's that idea again that you're showing what the character is seeing, hearing, smelling, all those things. I remember for this book when I wrote Essie's Way, I had in my head I wanted Esther to live in a shack that was on a, a short sort of land at each end and there was a reason for that historically is that her family, as she was owned the whole of the area, but she no longer lived in the main residence. She lived in, in sort of one of the workers' shacks. And it was funny, I remember getting on Google Earth and trying to find <laughs> a beach <laughs> to actually go to that looked like that. And um, and it was so it's roughly based on Potato Point on the New South Wales south coast. I hadn't been to Potato Point, so I actually went down there and spent a day down there just wandering around, doing some free writing, you know, just jotting things down, just really trying to get that 
vision, I guess, onto the page. And then, of course, you, you need to edit it down because you don't want to drown the reader in too much setting as well. I love that idea of going to a space and then free writing. Yeah, and photographs too are a great source, particularly if it's a place. I mean, look, obviously we can't go to every place probably that we write about. And I know there's many writers who write about places they've never been to and do it really, really well. And I think the internet is great now yeah. because, you know, we can Google Earth, we can look at images from places and also taking photographs of the place when you're there. Like when I wrote The Crossroads, which was set in out that Queensland and I did go there and I took loads of photos and I know I drew on those photos later in trying to really picture, you know, a moment or a place when I was doing the writing later on. The other thing I try and do is when I do find images you know, if I'm looking up, this could be anything from a character to a setting or whatever, I create a, a Pinterest board for each novel. And so I save those images. So it was interesting when I went to revise this book as All We Dream and I went back and I looked at my Essie's Way Pinterest board and, you know, I had images of an old woman playing a violin. I had different images that had inspired me for the first time around um, and saved them in Pinterest and then I added to them. But, yeah, I find that a really, it can be a great, procrastination yeah. tool too of course to just go googling things and adding them to your pinterest board Ooh, i might have to add your pinterest account to the show notes so people can look that up is it all still active and live yes definitely yep that's so great so people can just read the book and then go and have a look at all the inspirational photos and things that you've put on pinterest yeah yeah. That's also a great marketing tool isn't it because pinterest must have a great search yes one i've never tapped into I must say, I, I've never really gotten into the whole Pinterest promotion thing, but we'll, we'll add it to the list, Pam. Yes, let's. <laughs> and you might have to get someone on your podcast for the business of writing who specialises in. Have you had someone on for Pinterest? No, but I'd like to. I would yeah. like to. Yeah. Okay. The call is out there, people. Get in touch yep. with Pam. <laughs> Anybody that uses Pinterest to a great extent in their writing. Michelle, you did ask the question about editing yes. settings, and this is in the past and something I know you're familiar with, with as well is going through a scene or a chapter and highlighting different elements of the scene in different colours. So it's a system called the, Mar well, I got it from an author called Margie Lawson, the edit system, but I know a lot of people use it, calling it different things. So I have actually done this for whole books. <laughs> I haven't for the last few books, but I did initially <laughs> go through and highlight, you know, all of the setting would be in green, all of the dialogue in blue, all of the internalisation in yellow. And you can see then on the page how much you've got of everything. And if you have too big a chunk of anything, you can think, oh, yeah, I'll either cut that down or break it up and filter it through the rest of the scene or chapter. So that, that's just a really good editing tool that I find that works for, for lots of different reasons. That's such a good idea. I remember having an awful lot of inner dialogue that had to be cut down or reutilized. Yellow. Interesting you say that because I remember when I wrote my first literary novel and it was very internal. The character was in her head all the time. When I wrote Blackwater Lake in my subsequent books, there was a lot more action. It was a lot more plot based. But I do find that in writing Deep Point of View, I've gone back to inserting a lot of internal stuff. Not you know, pages and pages of it, but but certainly um, on every page you're going to get some internalisation because if you want to relate to that character and you really want to be deep in the character's skin, you've got to know what they're thinking. So you talked about how quickly you had to write this novel. Was there any plotting at all or was that something that you just had to pants and then afterwards go back and lay a bit of plotting over the top? Well, I did have that very rough synopsis, which did change quite a bit along the way. Um, and, and I guess when you're contracted and you have to give, you know, a synopsis to your publisher, that is one advantage you have <laughs> as a, as a pantser by at heart, it pushed me into thinking ahead about the plot, but it was only a really rough skeleton. So it really was a matter of just sitting down every day and going, okay, what happens next? Um, and I guess Having the main turning points can really help with that process. So if you get to your inciting incident, work that out and then maybe work out, you know, what your your climax is and then maybe you work out your 25% and midpoint. So that, that doesn't always happen either. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to work that out. 
you know, and the whole plotting and pantsing debate is a really interesting one. Um, I am a pantser by heart. I have had to plot more, particularly when I've had external deadlines to meet with publishers. But I do remember with this book getting to a point where when I was writing Essie's Way, the original version, just being absolutely blocked and just going, right, I have no idea what is going to happen next. And I remember procrastinating for probably a good couple of weeks and I was on a tight deadline and I was getting very panicky about it. And then one day I just said to myself, just sit down and write something, you know, just write something. It doesn't matter what it is. And I am the kind of writer, and even though I know this, I still have not had it, you know, (laughs) it's not tattooed into my DNA yet, unfortunately, (laughs) that if I just sit down and write, something will come. You know, and that whole idea that when you write your first draft, you're really finding the story, you're finding out who the characters are. It is harder when you've got a tight deadline because you're conscious all the time. But this has to be a story. It has to have a plot, you know. Um, But I think if you can, again, it's that trusting yourself. Trust that it will happen. A story will form in some way. And then you do have the opportunity in that revision process to go back and work on that, you know, refine the turning points, fix up all the, you know, cut out the dead wood, add in bits that you haven't had there initially. Um, mm. It's really about trusting yourself. And that's I find that a really hard thing still after six mm. novels. I just, I, I still sit down and think, no, I can't do this because I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a few things that you can fall back on? Like, okay, I'll just throw an obstacle at them or I'll just make them move somewhere. I'll make them change location or or I'll bring in a new character. Do you just think, okay, what's in my toolbox? Yeah, the toolbox. So I know when I wrote Blackwater Lake as part of Nano, it's the only one I've actually finished in Nano 2009, even though I've started others. My mantra at the time was make things worse. So if I get stuck, um, I would just think, right, how can I make things worse for her? What, what's going to happen that's going to be worse than what, what's already happened. And that's a really good one, I think, because you do want that escalating tension. You know, you don't want to have, you know, we talk about that messy middle or the muddy middle where everything just sort of plods along and nothing much happens. You see her in one scene, you see her in another scene, but there's no escalation of tension. So if you're making things worse, there is going to be in some way an escalation of tension. And then I'm finding with the book I'm writing at the moment, which is a sequel to Blackwater Lake, don't really have much of a plot, but I've got, you know, the character and a few situations and circumstances. And I've tried to set up at the beginning a number of different tricky situations for her. So like yesterday, for instance, I thought, okay, I don't really know what's going to happen next. What's a tricky situation I can I can put her into that, you know, I've set up at the beginning. And like you say, just throw her in with a different character, throw her in into a different place. And, you know, a lot of that is going to be cut back or cut out, you know, completely later on probably, but at least it's moving the plot forward. Yeah. And that's what you want to be doing is moving the plot forward all the time, not just treading water. You might have to tread water for quite a while in the draft. Something clicks in in that creative part of our brain and we go, oh, right, okay, yep, that works. And it's just trusting that that process is going to work, isn't it? Because it always does. The ideas yeah. always come but we we doubt that it will and we get all you know worried that it's never gonna happen and we're never gonna be able to write another (laughs) word but I don't know when you least expect it probably when you're on the little tractor going around feeding the horses Pam boom idea race back to the house get it down yeah I do get some of those but I must say for me I find it's the writing that actually brings the ideas I'm not someone that can sit down and dream up a scene with notes or, you know, I might jot down a couple of notes at the beginning or just go for, you know, I know that people have great revelations when they're walking. Mm. For me, it's the actual physical act of, of writing and hands on the keyboard. I used to, I used to write by hand, but now it's um, typing. That actually seems to get those cogs turning. Now, you teach a course called Turning Up the Tension, don't you? I do. Have you got one of those courses coming up that people might be able to? I am actually teaching one for Writing New South Wales later in the year, in November. Of November, if you have a look on the Writing New South Wales website. We'll put that in the show notes as well. I, I know that you're great at turning up the tension yourself. I having just read your latest manuscript, which I could not put down. So <laughs> you're a bit of a master at that. 
Well, I, again, I, I have to attribute that to Donald Mass. Thank you, by the way. But this is something that has just stayed with me ever since I've read it from him, and it was tension on every page. And that doesn't mean that, you know, they have to be out having fisticuffs or, you know, having a full-on argument or whatever. It's just some sort of friction, some sort of dissonance, something that's not quite right, whether it's in the dialogue, a contrast between the character, what the character says and what they does, or the way they perceive someone. It can be just something minor, but having those little bits of tension on every page and then obviously escalating and then when you're getting to the climax of a scene or the climax of a book, it just helps to keep that connection with the reader because we want something to happen when we're reading. Yeah. We want to know that, you know, we can appreciate beautiful writing and we can be really immersed in that side of things. But if you want to keep someone reading to the end of the book and getting them turning the page, then you really want to be looking at the way tension operates within a scene. So whenever I am doing revision, one of the things I'll revise for is there tension in this scene. Have I captured that in, you know, any of those numerous ways you can do it? Um, so I think that's that's a really important element for me. I guess I, I sort of now subconsciously do that to some extent when I'm drafting, but I definitely fine-tune all that in the revision process. That's such great advice, and it makes me want to go back to Donald Mass and have another look at that because he also talks about tension at the micro level even at sentence level yeah 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 yeah. oh it's great stuff yeah everyone should just go and do the course at writing new south wales pam i have a question actually three questions from anna fox kirk she is a listener who follows on Instagram and you should all go and check Anna's Instagram page out, Anna Fox Kirk. Anna says, I really enjoyed All We Dream. My questions are, so firstly, she asks, in the editing process, how does Pam refine and edit her characters and make them so engaging? Okay, so shout out. Hi, Anna. Anna's an author and uh, in the Not So Solitary Scribes group that we we pop into, Michelle. So thank you for the questions, Anna, and for reading All We Dream. So I guess in refining my characters, um, part of it is the deep point of view thing. So really looking at getting into their skin as much as I can. Another really important part of character creation for me is backstory and using that backstory in a way that is going to reveal important aspects of the character to the reader. So I've talked a little bit about that with Essie and Esther in All We Dream. Um, I'm really a big one for knowing, you know, what the character's childhood and early life has been, even if a lot of that doesn't go into the novel itself. I feel that you need to know that as the author. You know, it's about that method acting thing. If we don't know who they are and where they've come from, what have been the significant events in their life, we can't really inhabit them. Um, so knowing things like the wound, you know, what what is the, an event that happened in their early life that has really impacted them psychologically so I'm really big on delving into the character psychology and I really love the one stop for writers website so these are the people that wrote the emotion thesaurus that a lot of writers will be familiar with but they also have psychological traits thesaurus I think they've got a wound thesaurus they've got a a setting thesaurus Um, all of those things are collated on a website called one stop for writers and I'll often go in there and just you know, if I get stuck or if I think, you know, I'm not sure I've really got enough handle on, on her character, I'll go in there and do a bit of note-taking, um, build up a character profile. They've got a great character builder. So you can build up all these things about their personality traits, their character, their wound. So, you know, I talked about when Miranda found that necklace, for instance, and she's got this vague memory. Oh, she says, has a conversation with the mother. Didn't you have a necklace that was an old antique necklace? I think that would look really good with my wedding dress. And then when the mother explodes, of course, it takes her back to in her mind to the time that she was caught in her mother's bedroom trying that necklace on and her mother just went off a nut. Um, And, of course, for a young girl, a child, experiencing that wrath of of the parent, of her mother, in a way that she didn't understand, it really left an impression on her. So, you know, there can be things like that that, you know, they don't have to be super traumatic or things that we would understand as super traumatic events but just things that impact that person's psyche in a way um and and that are are still stored away there for them 
And I think you can also use backstory by holding back some of the backstory and using it as a big reveal mm. later on. So I do that in Blackwater Lake where you don't really know what happened. You know that something happened with the main character's sister, but you don't know exactly what. And then because we're in that character skin and she's not ready to face it at that point, you have to wait until it, the character is put under pressure and has to face that moment. And then if you reveal the backstory there, you know, you're you're holding all that tension all the way through to that point of revelation. So I hope that that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, that's all great. She also asks, what do you do to capture the reader's attention and get emotion on the page? Yeah, another thing that I, I read, and it might have been Donald Mass, I can't remember, which really um, put a light bulb on for me about emotion, is that characters can experience a number of emotions in one scene. And you know, we tend to just focus on how she's feeling here and, and naming one emotion in our head. I don't ever name emotion on the page. That's another aspect, I guess, of deep point of view is I would never say she felt angry or she felt frustrated or, you know, she felt sad. I'd show that through their actions, through their dialogue, through their thoughts. The other thing about, yeah, having multiple emotions. So when I go back to edit, one one revision I'll do is just on emotion and I'll look at, okay, what's the main emotion going on here and then what are the what are the other emotions that are happening for the character and have I shown them because you know when we react to something or we experience something we have multiple emotions at one time and I think sometimes we need to layer that more into the writing so that the reader can can really experience it as well. So from a practical point of view say she had two emotions could you do that by having perhaps an action that showed that she was sad and then some dialogue that showed she was also a little bit miffed, for example. So could you show that and but use action for one, dialogue for another perhaps, just to mix it up a bit? Yeah, yes. And that is creating tension in itself because there's a conflict between, you know, what she's saying and what she's doing. And I think that example you read out before about James with the beer and the shrug, mm. you know, like he's trying to be supportive, mm. but, you know, it's like, oh. Move on type yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> so Anna has a last question. She has seen on social media that you've just sent your latest manuscript to your agent. Please can Pam explain how she works or collaborates with her agent and the benefits of having an agent? So that's an interesting question. It is an interesting question. So yeah, well ironically, when I was first published traditionally, I didn't have an agent because I got in with her ship through the manuscript development program and I was picked up that way and then was contracted for each of, of the four novels that I have published with them so far. Um, I didn't have an agent and it crossed my mind at some points, oh, maybe I should have an agent. You know, I tended to just get the next contract and sign it. I did have someone from the ASA, Australian Society of Authors, have a look at the, the first contract or two and there were a couple of minor changes but, but nothing really and then I, each contract was the same. So when it came time to publish my fifth book, which was more of a women's fiction, less rural romance, Hachette decided that it wasn't one they wanted to publish at that time because I was under contract. I had to actually show them the next book. And then I ended up getting an agent sort of in a roundabout way that I won't go into, but I did get an agent and that is Jeanne Rickman's at Cameron's agency. And, you know, Jeanne has been fantastic. She was very, very supportive of me independently publishing Cross My Heart. We did send it through to a few other publishers at the time, but with the time that it takes for publishers to look at things, to get back to you, you know, it can be a very long drawn out process. It had been a couple of years since I'd had a book out at that time. And so I just decided I wanted to get something out pretty quickly at that point. Um, and she was really, really supportive of that. Uh, and she is reading my current manuscript because you're mine and looking at publishers that we're going to send it to. So for me, if you are thinking of being uh, or trying to get a trad publication, you don't have to have an agent. You know, you can absolutely be uh, published without one. But I do think agents have connections with publishers. They know the types of novels, the types of writing that different publishers like. Um, they do have personal relationships with them so they can just pick up the phone and say, hey, are you interested in this? It gets you out of the slush pile. You don't have to sit and wait, hopefully, for six or 12 months 
to get a response. So for all those reasons and also for the business side, like I'm not good at, you know, the, the fine print on contracts or also if you're not a person who is good at really pushing yourself forward and really standing your ground on things, I think for that reason, the agent is worth their commission or whatever it is that they charge. I hope that answers your question, Anna. Pam, thank you for your time today. So much gold in there for the listeners. I hope I haven't rambled on too much. No, <laughs> never. If you've rambled, I, we're two ramblers, let's just face it. <laughs> we are ramblers. As the two hours ticks over. Three hour episode. <laughs> Oh, we do love a chat. We love our writing chats. I yes. really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. And where can people find you, Pam? So you can find my website at pamelacook.com.au and I know on Instagram seems to be a place I'm on the most lately. It's Pamela Cook Writes, W-R-I-T-E-S. Uh, you'll also find me at Rights for Women podcast. That's rightsforwomen.com. And I've got a Facebook page, Pamela Cook Author. Great. And I'm going to put links to all of those in the show notes. And I highly recommend if you haven't listened to Rights for Women podcast that you all go and immediately subscribe because it is a fantastic writing podcast. And Pam covers, it's the business of writing episodes, the heart of writing and the craft of writing, which is, I just think, a wonderful format because there's something for everyone in there, no matter what stage of your writing journey that you're at, isn't there? Yeah, well, there, you know, when I really thought about what are the different aspects of that I'm interested in, and they were definitely the three, and then I also have, like, new release authors as well. Um, I'm finding with some episodes I'm tending to cover all three aspects within the episode rather than having them as separate, but I do still have, you know, some separate business for writing episodes as well, so... Yeah. And I've got Craft of Writing as well with Cassie Hamer next on Craft of Writing. Ooh, that'll be a good one. Her latest book, The Truth About yeah. Making It, is it you're going to be talking about that one? Mm. Fabulous. Yeah, so we're talking about writing multiple viewpoints, actually. Oh, yes, because that covers different generation of women, doesn't it? The mother, the grandmother, mm. and the daughter. Yes, fantastic. Oh, look forward to that. Thanks again, lovely. I'll see you soon. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Mine too. There you go, Pamela Cook. Isn't she great? I love her. And some really practical tips there which you can apply no matter where you're at with your writing. The links to all of those references that Pam mentioned, like the Deep Point of View info from Lisa Hall Wilson and The Emotional Craft of Fiction by Donald Mass and Margie Lawson's colour-coded editing technique, are all in the show notes which you can find on whatever app you're listening to this on, so Spotify or Apple or Google or on the website at writersbookclubpodcast.com. You'll also find links to buy Pam's novel, All We Dream, there too. Now, on to this month's guest. If you write crime or mystery or psychological thrillers, you're going to love this one. International multi-million bestseller Mr. Michael Robotham will be joining me to talk all things writing with a deep dive into his latest novel, Lying Beside You. This is the third novel in the Cyrus Haven series, and this book is just next level. Cyrus's brother, who killed their entire family when they were teenagers, is being released. I've got chills just thinking about it. And of course, as well as the emotional drama that's playing out in his personal life, Cyrus has also been called upon to help solve another murder and an abduction with the help from one of the best, I think, female characters I've read in a long time, Evie Cormack the troubled teenager who has been in the first two novels as well. And she also has a terribly traumatic past and she has a special skill. She can tell when people are lying. So I highly recommend this book. I honestly can't wait to pick Michael's writing brain and I'd love to get your questions too. This is a chance to ask anything you like about his writing process. Michael has written 17 novels and sold over 8 million copies all over the world, so he knows a thing or two about this crazy old business called writing. So head over to writersbookclubpodcast.com where you'll find links to buy both the paperback and ebook versions of Lying Beside You, which is out now with Hachette. And as always, if you'd like a chance to win a copy of the novel, just head over to my Instagram or Facebook page where you'll find instructions on how to enter. Entries close on July 10th, but of course, if you're listening to this podcast in the future, 
there's a new giveaway every month. So just keep an eye on the socials or sign up to my newsletter at michellebarraclough.com. Are you enjoying the podcast? I really hope you are. If so, and you have a couple of minutes to spare, I'd be so delighted if you left a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Apparently, it helps other people who might be looking for a podcast about writing craft to find it. So thank you. I recorded today's episode on the beautiful unceded lands of the Garigal people of the Eora Nation. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you next month. Until then, stay safe, stay dry, and happy writing.